And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, creator of... Uh, Coming to us all the way from Visions RPG, creators of the upcoming project Visions of Zumea, which is currently in open playtesting. The one and only, the visionary one, Samuel Thrace. How you doing? Thank How you doing today, man? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thanks for thanks for coming on. Um, it's a bit of a tradition to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, with that in mind, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what was it that made it stick <clears throat> yeah it's a great question um so i'm i'm a bit of a newcomer i would say um especially compared to i think at least in my experience a lot of folks in the space right so um i've really only been you know like playing for a little over five years now right so so pretty recently um you know i've, I've been kind of uh a, you know a huge video game guy i been extremely into fantasy you know i was um, I was that that kid in you know fifth grade who was reading the Silmarillion, right? So so I've definitely been in in you know uh, adjacent spaces for a while, right? Um, but it was actually my brother um, who got me into it. Um, he'd been a giant fan of Acquisitions Incorporated for a while. Mm -hmm. um, I never really got into that one, uh, but he actually started a family game for his own family, um, which they invited me to kind of uh, take a whirl in, right? Um, I started, uh, this is, for, for those familiar, it would be pretty funny. Um, I started as a, a Kenku monk, which, you know, of course, uh, the Kenku have some idiosyncrasies with the way they communicate, right? So probably not the best and definitely switch characters relatively quickly, right? But um, definitely, you know, we started with 5th edition, right? Um, and then from there, you know, I basically, like that campaign sort of ended uh, relatively uh, quickly thereafter. And, you know, I, I kind of... You know, like you know, like I'm sure a lot of people say, right? You, you, one of the intimidating things from the outside, I think, for, about RPGs, right, is this concept of um, the fact that like really anything can happen, right? So from from the outside, that can be a, a little bit scary, right? Because you're like, like, what am I supposed to do? What are the rules, right? Like we all play board games together, and like you know, family games, things like that. There are rules, right, that are a little bit more um, usually rigorous, right, and more on rails, right? Um, video games, same way, right? So. You know, this concept of okay, what do you do? And the answer to that question being pretty much anything you can think of is you know scary. But once you like kind of jump into the deep end, right? It's it's intoxicating, right? Like you can't get enough of it. It was great. Um, and I'd always been kind of like an amateur, you know, world builder, right? Um, you know, I, I dabbled when I was much much younger with the idea of you know I want to write a book someday or a novel, right? And um, my uh, literary chops definitely don't. <laughs> <laughs> weren't weren't enough for that, right? But you know, I've always had these kind of like ideas in my head, right? And and these kind of world building ideas. And so, kind of the next step for me was I wanted to build kind of my own world, right? A homebrew world, right? Um, and you know, I kind of looked at some systems, right? And I found, you know, I mean, like probably like a lot of people do, right? Where you start tweaking a few things, right? Because they don't quite fit what you want them to do. And then you tweak a few more things, right? And after about a year or two of that, um, the thing that I had really wasn't even very recognizable anymore, right? Um, and then I said, okay, well, you know, I got this far, right? Let's uh, let's go all the way, right? Let's let's see, you know, if I was going to do all this from scratch, right? And I was going to, you know, not necessarily uh, uh, bind myself to any of the uh, yeah, you know, each system kind of has like these kind of like pillar stone rules in it, right? That you're not really supposed to break, right? Um, or change, right? Like if I was going to potentially look at, you know, modifying some of those or, you know, what would I do if I had to design this particular aspect from scratch, right? And so I, I did that exercise, um, you know, played around with a few people and it got really, um, you know, pretty positive feedback, right? So, uh, you know, I said, okay, well... Um, you know, I know this space is extremely crowded, right? And has just an insane number of talented people in it, right? So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I just, you know, I wanted to kind of say, okay, well, you know, let's just put this out there, right? And see, you know, 
it, you know, is this something that anybody else has a good time with too, right? And that's so that's kind of where this all started, right? And it's kind of spiraled a little bit from there, right? But uh, but yeah, that that's how it came about. Yeah. Now, give now given that given that that does cl that does clarify one thing that I was noticing when I went through the playtest documents as part of my own research. And that is that there's a significant amount of um, 5e's DNA. Was it a, when it came to the early conceptions of visions? Was it a case of um, you were you were playing and running a fair amount of 5e, but there were things that just didn't gel with you? Yeah, definitely. Right. I mean, I think if you go way back to like the genesis of where this thing first started, right? It was definitely um, you know 5e homebrew, right? Um, and we've been slowly kind of peeling away that layer um over time right and um you know like you said we're, we're currently in our first play test right now um looking to release the second play test in a few months and i think you know some of the changes you see there will be us going even farther away from that kind of initial um tapings right so so yeah there were definitely some things right specifically that kind of you know, not to not to hate on a particular system or anything, right? But I think there were some things that I just would have done differently, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so one of the big things that I was trying to do with this system, right, was, um, you know, kind of classically people think of, you know, 5th edition as kind of like easy to get into. Um, I find that really interesting because I, <laughs> um, maybe compared to previous editions, right? But there's definitely lots of idiosyncrasies with 5th edition, right? Yes. Um yeah, so, uh, you know, but like, you know, some aspects of it are, are not too bad, right, I guess, right, especially from, you know, you can play it in a way that, that's that's pretty straightforward, I guess, is a good way to, to describe it, right, and of course, like, Advantage is Advantage was, was a great addition, I think, um, and then, like, you know, something like Pathfinder, right, for example, is, you know, you ha it has that kind of um, uh, conception, you know, or the, the preconceived notion about it, right, is that it it's a very crunchy system, right? There's, you know, if, if you love depth, right, you you can get it there, right? And then, um, but at the same time, right, like, you know, there's, you know, maybe, you know, there's there's that whole, like, uh, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure you've seen the joke, right, of the, the person, you know, uh, trying to compute, like, their attack roll in Pathfinder, and 25 minutes later, they realize that they'd eaten a carrot on the fourth moon of the third year of the sun, right, and have to redo it or something, right? So... Um, you know, maybe looking for like a middle ground there, right? So, because one of the things that really I was trying to do was make something where the rules could be described in a way that was relatively um, what I'll call clean, right? Like, like here's a rule that kind of applies, right? And we'll we'll have some special cases where maybe it doesn't apply, right? But those will be called out. But overall, this will apply across the across the board, right? And then you know those kind of clean rules leading to something that had more depth and choice, right? Um, one of the things that like my playtesters like to give me a hard time about is um, they they really never tell me things like, oh, I do the same thing this turn that I always do. I do X Y Z, right? Because as soon as they say that, um, their class is getting changed, right? <laughs> so like you know, I I really didn't want to make a system where there was an easy correct answer. Right, where there was always choices, always trade offs, always interesting things to do. Because to me, that's that's what's interesting, right? Um, so to talk about like maybe some specific things, right? Like you know, uh, you know, fifth edition has the concept of like uh, uh, attribute score increases, where you can take attribute score increases, or um, I think they're called feats there, yeah. right? Um, that that seemed to me like you know the feed system is cool, but like an ASI and taking stats is technically the right answer most of the time, right? Like if you want to play suboptimally, which is fine, right? Um, not that there's any right or wrong way to play, right? But um, you know your character is mathematically weaker if you take a fun trait, right, or a fun feat, which I just felt like that was a bad choice, right? Um, or like as an example of. Um, I, uh, like, sorry. Go ahead. I um, I remember. I remember when I first when I first um covered, five e and the, and that th and that thing was brought up. Um. It very it very much felt like overcompensation because feats were feats were introduced back in two thousand with um, third edition, and it really exploded, to the point where there were, a. For in, in no uncertain terms, a shitload of feats after a, after the span of a few years, 
and <laughs> yeah. I think they wanted to dial it back, but in the in the in the process of trying to dial it back, they ended up overcompensating and kind of missing the point about why feats were established to begin with. Right, yeah. And so, you know, I know there's, you know, the thing with, with D&D too, right, not to talk too much about other systems, right, but like, you know, that has a whole, um, there's a lot of history there, right? Um, there's a lot of things that like, they want to continue because there's lots of love and history behind it, or they're trying to address something from a previous edition, right? So, um, so yeah, so like in, in our, you know, in the vision system, you know, we're trying to do things where, um, Basically, my goal is to always make interesting choices, and they're never to be a perfect choice. Like, everything should always have a trade-off, right? And it's, you know, those are, like, the interesting decisions to make, right? Um, you know, like, uh, as an example of one of the things uh, that the system makes you do, like, one of the very first things that we had in there, right, is, um, you know, there's a concept of during uh, combat, right? There's a concept of... Uh, uh, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a kind of a standard combat structure where you have um, different turns, one, a turn for each player, character, or monster um, that are separated into rounds, right? Um, so there's things you can do outside of your turn, right, that use up uh, a single resource slot called your uh, reaction, right? So what I wanted to make sure of is that there was always more than one interesting thing to do with your reaction so that if... Uh, um, something came up where you could use your reaction, it wasn't just, oh, well, I can actually use it now. I want to use it, right? So, you know, there's the idea of parrying, right? So um, if somebody um, is attacking you, you can try to, you know, parry with a weapon that you're holding, like a melee weapon that you're holding, right? Um, at the same time, if you're engaged um, with uh, a combatant within melee range, right, and they try to move away from you, you can do an attack of opportunity, right? So... If you if you parry their incoming attack, right, that will prevent you from doing an attack of opportunity later. So now this thing that's just an automatic, oh yeah, I do that because I can, now has to become a decision, right? Like, mm -hmm. do I use my reaction for this or do I use it for potentially something later, right? And so that kind of thing was exactly what I'm, you know, I try to put that everywhere I possibly can, right? Where these these interesting choices, none of which are perfect, all have like their upsides and downsides. And the one of the thing one of the things that I found that I found interesting that you that I had seen in I had seen in previous iterations that you that you decided to bring back is defenses. Um, because and I'm I am go I I know you wanted to avoid um talking about other systems, but given how given how um a lot there is a lot of five E DNA. Sure. In, yeah. In visions, it's generally going to be unavoidable. <laughs> yeah. No, no problem. Um, plus, one of my philosophies is art is a response to other art. S Definitely. So I look at the I look at the fact that you have um, you have the armor class and you have a, and you have a set of defenses. Um, and what I'm instantly reminded of is. The is the old saving throws, or in fourth edition, it was um, it was the four defenses. And granted, you've got grand, you've got five. And what I'm curious about is what pro what prompted you to bring to bring in defenses as opposed to the whole armor class and um, ability ba ability based saving throw approach that five E has. So so that one was primarily driven by. Um like a design uh, construct that, that I have that on your turn as a player, right, if you want to try to do something that is not assured, right, so anything that you have to, you know, or there's going to be a dice roll involved, if at all possible, I want the player to do that, right? So um, one of the things that always felt sort of weird to me um, was the concept of, okay, I cast a spell, Right, and then this creature rolls to see if it works. Right, so the G, the you know, the the DM rolls to see if it works. Right, so you know that to me is you know I'm doing something that doesn't you know on my turn as a player that that doesn't have a you know automatic success to it, but I I don't roll for it. Right, that just that that wasn't appealing to me. Right, in addition to that, right, it also like narratively are are we kind of saying that 
you cast the spell exactly with the same uh, efficiency and efficacy every time, right? And it's just up to this creature to see if it can resist it, right? That also seemed kind of weird to me, right? Like the, so really like the defense scores came from, I want to put the power of spell casting back in the hands of the spell caster, right? Um, so the way that it kind of works in the vision system is that initial success failure of the spell is a spell casting role, right? Which is very similar to like an attack role from a, a martial character, right? Um, it's a spell casting role by the caster against one of those defenses, right? And then um, if it succeeds and it has like a lingering effect, right? Like it stuns somebody or, you know, um, uh, paralyzes somebody or, or what have you, right? Then that creature is now trying to overcome this effect on subsequent turns. Then they roll checks against it, right? Then that creature tries to overcome it. But that initial role is you so the other thing that that opens up if we're gonna kind of like you know talk about from a design space is it makes it much more interesting too because um you have this you know i mean like technically i guess you would have it in like a saving throw system as well right but um i definitely designed the spells in this system to where uh there's lots of spells that target lots of different defenses which makes you kind of think about what spells would work best against the particular monster you're fighting or the particular enemy you're fighting right so if you're fighting a giant that probably has pretty good constitution or you know constitution which affects their fortitude score um you know maybe you bust out something that goes against wit instead right and like to an extent this this also works with the you know intelligence based saving throws etc right but there's just a lot more variation um in the in the spells and the vision system which again has that same um going back to my previous point right um you know i, I definitely have players in playtest say man i really want to cast this fortitude based spell because it's my best spell in this situation like pure numbers wise right but i'm pretty sure it's going to fail so do i make the, do i risk that right um or do i cast this spell that might be a little bit weaker but targets their wit right like those are exactly the decisions we're going for and like having these defense scores just opens them up right um it's just it opens up so much more design space mm -hmm. And speaking of design space, I want to talk about the um, approach that you have with um, skill checks. Um, <laughs> yeah. Now, in, in in this particular case, you have you have a, you have a tier based approach that, in a weird way, kind of reminded me of um, of games like Fudge. Um, in the sense that you you're going through. Th going through uh, four tiers from inept all the way to expert and mm -hmm. instead of a proficiency instead of a static proficiency bonus you're having people roll d roll um d10s to deter to determine um to determine the modifier to the f to the flat d20 roll um what prompted this can what prompted the shift over from a d10 pool to the to uh, from the original static approach. Yeah, so that's um, this is actually something that's changing. It's one of the, the biggest things that's changing in Playtest 2 as well. Um, so I'll definitely give you the reason why we were looking at that for the first iteration, and then all the reasons why I don't think it quite hit the mark and what we're trying to do after, right? So um, one of the things I wanted to do with D20 rolls, right, um, was uh try to make them a little more interesting than just flat modifiers mm -hmm. right um and then the other thing i was trying to fix with skill checks in particular was a particular pet peeve i have of um skill systems that rely on modifiers from just your uh excuse me from just your attribute scores right or the your attribute score is, like a single attribute score is is always involved in a particular skill check and that's the fact that in you know, systems like 5th edition, if I want to make a socially awkward warlock, I either have to have terrible spell casting because my charisma is very low, right? Or I have, to, or, or, or I'm always going to get a, at least a plus five, right, to all those rolls, right? Um, there's something about being a powerful warlock, right, that always makes me at least a little bit charismatic right and, and a little bit good in social situations mm -hmm. and that was that was something that was frustrating to me right because i felt like it was a um it, it limits the players on on what they can do right so um really what i wanted to do was take skills completely away from attributes altogether um 
unfortunately, I don't think that was 100% successful, and I'll, I'll get to that, right? But yeah, so uh, the really cool thing about the system we have, right, um, like you said, is it's just basically a number of D10s that you roll. And so as you progress up, right, you roll more D10s, right? So you only take one of those, right? So you're not potentially getting like a plus 40 if you're rolling 40 tens and you're level 20 right it's just that it's getting much much more consistent right so um because you're taking rolling 40 tens and taking the highest right so it's like uh quadruple advantage or whatever right triple advantage so um you know i thought that was really neat because uh the cool thing is the bounds on that skill system right were such that a level one character could technically roll the same as a level 20 character right um who had like expertise or whatever right um it's just what happened way less often right which kind of makes sense if you think about skills right like it's not that you know necessarily you couldn't um especially if you had some kind of like uh really good uh innate talent and a skill right so that you couldn't perform a lock picking you know check really well occasionally even as like a level one character it's that as a level 20 character you do that pretty much all the time right uh and so i really like that so that so the downside to that was um a few fold right one of the feedback we've already gotten from playtest one um that i definitely understand and kind of went against our my design philosophy i said earlier where we're trying to make these nice clean rules that apply across the board mm -hmm. Uh, is that skill checks look nothing like any other check in the entire system, right? Um, which was obviously kind of a disadvantage, right? Like you had to learn these special rules that only applied to skill checks and nothing else, right? Uh, the other thing was that when you got to higher levels, right? And when you're rolling three or four D10s, when you start adding the concept of like bonus dice or bonus die or malice dice, like a bonus or a malice that like certain skills or spells or, or features could give you, mm -hmm. you could potentially be rolling like six dice. And that's not even including any advantage or disadvantage on a single uh, skill check. And it's not just adding all those up. You have to do different things with all those dice, right? So it just felt like it got a little bit convoluted at high levels, right? And then the fact that it wasn't, really related to anything else in the system um kind of make it make, made it felt like it missed the mark just a little bit right so what we're trying out for the next play test is a bit of a preview right um it's still kind of in a tiered system like that um we're ditching the um the terminology of proficiency just because that has as you mentioned some kind of um like you think of proficiency and it, it's got like a, a some preconceived notions from other systems in it it's got um, some baggage it's got some baggage, exactly. <laughs> so we're going with uh, aptitude, right? And so basically, um, uh, you uh, it's still kind of like a tiered system, right, where you can be, um, you know, kind of, uh, uh, it, you know, basically inept at something all the way up to, you know, having um, kind of mastery in it, right, if you want to think about the tiers. But uh, basically, it defines whether or not you add um, uh, aptitude die to it, which is... Uh, uh, functionally, from a math perspective, right, it, it functions similar to what the proficiency score does in other systems, where it's something that levels up as you do at specific tiers. Um, but it's another dicey roll, which I think is more fun, right? Um, and it goes from like a D4 up to a D10, right, um, increasing in, in tiers, um, levels 5, 10, and 15, right? Um, and then in addition to that, what we're doing to get a little more... Um, you know, to get like the modifier piece to it, right? Um, is we're reintroducing the idea of pulling a little bit from a, from an attribute score, uh, but instead of a single attribute score, right? You pull from one of several attribute scores that would apply to that particular skill. Um, and then to address the previous problem I talked about before, um, if you have the lowest tier of a skill, like if you're um, basically incompetent at it right um you don't get to add anything to it you don't get to add a modifier you don't get to add anything at all you actually have disadvantage in the role all the time right you're just bad right mm -hmm. so it still fixes the problem of i have a uh you know like an intel you know uh, a uh willpower based caster right that i want to be socially awkward it's still okay right so and the, and the benefits of that aptitude score a system right or aptitude dice system, excuse me, is that that now applies to all the D20 rolls, right? So mm -hmm. if you have um, aptitude in spellcasting, your spellcasting roll looks exactly the same, right? It's just that you pull in your modifier as your spellcasting attribute. If you have aptitude in a weapon, right, it's the same. The, the modifier you pull in is that weapon's uh, applicable modifier, and then you add your aptitude dice. So now all your D20 
checks and then the skill system or the uh, skill checks excuse me, or sorry the, the attribute checks are the same way so now the attribute check the skill check the spell casting check and the attack roll or sorry a spell casting roll and attack roll all four of those follow the exact same uh paradigm for how you do them all right now give now um i've i've had a i've had a lot of debates about um about the folly that ha that happens whenever a whenever a game is ostensibly des ostensibly designed for quote unquote all kinds of fantasy, but really not. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, and uh, and yeah, and yes, yeah, so, yeah. The big the bigger hitters are a per are perfect examples of this, where they where they talk about how they're how they're built for all kinds of fantasy, but in reality they're they're still very, they're still very, um, very, Tol very Tolkien British esque, mm -hmm. along with a, along with a hodgepodge of of other stuff, but leaning ver leaning very European. Um, and given given that, what st what style of fantasy would you say that Visions is trying to encourage? So that's a that's a fantastic question, um, especially since one of the big things when we were first starting out with this, right, was that I had a specific kind of world building in mind that I didn't feel like the existing systems I was exposed to could really cover, right? So um, from that perspective, and we definitely have gotten feedback on this as well, right? Um, and it, it is definitely, uh, I wouldn't even say it's a limitation in our system, but it, it's kind of like an intended limitation, if you will, right? The system has specific uh, world attributes that are kind of baked into the mechanics right um so it, it's still sort of like a little bit in the kind of tolkien-esque fantasy realm right um one of the big key items in the kind of the visions of zumea system is this concept of these this ancient um race of peoples called the elders right that disappeared long ago right um you know uh eventually we get to like a you know game master type you know guide right the They'll give more information. I don't want to give too many spoilers story-wise, right? But um, they're very fundamental everywhere because um, they had a heavy influence on, um, like, all of their... All, basically, their technology or the remnants of it are what power the entire Arcanist class archetype, for example, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, one of the things... So th I think there's kind of, like, a, a few kind of fundamental tenets to... Um, if you're running a visions game, kind of even if you're not using our world particularly, like what does your world need to address? Because the mechanics assume this, right? Uh, the first is that magic is very specialized, right? Um, uh, you don't have uh, wizards, right, that can draw from you know seven or an eight or nine different schools of magic, right? Um, you know, there's you know this kind of arcane magic that was leveraged in the elders and their technology. Uh, there's this elemental magic that is very tied to uh, the Jadoan plane, which is basically the material plane uh, equivalent in this world, right? Uh, there's this uh, spectral magic that comes from the spectral plane. Um, there's gossamer magic, which is uh, a sort of a flavor of kind of holy magic where it comes from um, these gossamer threads, which are thought to be some kind of, uh, you know, afterlife, um, specifically for the mortal races, right? Mm -hmm. Um you know, so there's these different kinds of magic, and it's very rare for any of the classes to really be talented in more than um, one or two, right? A lot of the kind of spellcasting classes are actually uh, mostly predominantly in one. Um, even like the elemental magic, like the elementalist, it, like they actually pick um, based, you know, like only two of the sub elements within elemental magic to do, right? So that was one of the things is that the the magic is very specialized, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and the other part was um, the fact that basically religious adherence, right? So like, uh, you know, the ritualist class, right? Um, it is an entirely faith-based magic, right? Um, driven by faith itself, not actually divinely given, right? So it's a very different flow, right? Um, I always thought it was interesting in systems where the gods were like knowable, provable entities, um, because... At that point, is it really faith or is it just like allegiance, right? I mean, it's basically, you know that it's there, right? You're just mm -hmm. picking a particular deity to pledge your allegiance to, right? Um, in, in this system, the gods are not knowable, right? It is not really, 
um, they could be there, they could not, but they're not in the system, right? Um, they're not in the world, they're not in anything, right? So the thing that drives the the ritualist magic, right, is literally their their faith, their spiritual resolve, right? Mm-hmm. So so those are kind of some of the core tenets, I think, um, of this system. Uh, the other piece I have, especially that, that we get into some of the, like the the, you know, the fun art pieces for, is that um, the creatures of the old world, the elders, were very weird very weird looking kind of primordial creatures right so they're all a little bit off right um uh you know we're working on uh what will eventually be the cover for the the um the player guide which will be our take on dragons which probably will not look like anything that you've seen that (laughs) that you would call a dragon before right um so so we definitely wanted to kind of like do a little bit of uh uh twist on its head of of some of the kind of classic fantasy tropes there yeah now one of the things I did notice when I looked at when I took a look at the cast with that uh, the classes, especially the casting classes in this case, is is the fact that while there's while there is certainly the whole spell levels and the whole spe- and the whole spells per day thing, um, they're not exactly they're not exactly doing it the ex- the exact same route. It's in term in terms of in terms of having the grid of how of how many of each spells that they get that they get at each day, mm-hmm. um, was that was that a was that a conscious decision or was that something that just kind of fell into your lap? Um, it was a little bit of both, right? Um, I definitely so one of the things that this first play test has been really helpful um, is getting this initial feedback. One of the things I was actually worried about was uh, straying too far from kind of known. Um, uh, known entities, uh, and and one of the, definitely some of the feedback I'm getting has been very encouraging on uh, moving farther away, right from that. So that's definitely also the magic system is the other the skill system and the magic system are like the two big changes for playtest two that we're we're looking at. Um, so you know what you're saying is true, and and in the current playtest version, um, I think the most non-standard from you know kind of the classic. Um, uh, spell tiers, you know, kind of fancy and magic system, right, is the bard, which uh, has this concept of, like, mystical songs they can begin, and then it progresses through different stanzas, right, and they can cast verses at different stanzas, right, so it's kind of a cyclical within combat system. Um, so we're going in that kind of direction for pretty much all of the magic now. There really won't be any spells, like, any concept of spell slots anymore, right? So... Um, that was something that I, I think was was cool because I wanted to make it so that not all spellcasters were the same. So that was definitely a an intended change, right? So um, some of the spellcasters, like Arcanist and Elementalist, will still use kind of like a pool, like a a, a mana system, basically like a pool of, of points where the different tiers cost different mana. Um, so that'll that'll feel probably a little more familiar, especially to anybody who like comes from like a video game background, right? But um, the Bard has the the the, the kind of stanza system that progresses. Um, the uh, ritualist, as I said, the faith-based magic is is now on a resolve system where they basically get a big surge of resolve as they begin combat, um, and then they can uh, cast specific spells equal to their current resolve level, and it reduces each time they cast, and then they can like resurge themselves up a certain number of times a day. Mm-hmm. So it's another. It, it's similar to the bard, and it's kind of like a, a cyclical system, but it's in reverse, sort of. And there's only a certain number of kind of charges they have per day um, one of my favorites actually um because you know uh, especially you know, it was one that my brother helped me with as well because he's kind of a he's, a he's a big physics guru too um is the plane shaper who can kind of fundamentally change reality with their with their spells right mm-hmm. um and this concept of entropy which we really leaned into in the new spell system so basically um you build up entropy based on how powerful the plane shaping magic is you're using, how much you're changing the world around you, right? The more powerful spells, the more sort of entropic forces on your physical form there are. And if you ever exceed your current health points when you finish casting a spell, your new entropy level, if it ever exceeds your current health points, you literally fall unconscious, right? Um, your body begins to split apart, right? So it's this constant, um, uh, again, kind of like, risk management of okay i really want to cast this really big spell but man that's gonna put my entry really high and then i have to be careful not to take too much damage right like um you know i, I really love that kind of back and forth and that teetering on the edge of oblivion type of, of spell casting mm-hmm. now since we've dipped into it i do want to go into the class design that you ha- that you've got set up um 
uh, and this will be kind of lightning roundy. I'm, I'm just going to go from top from top to bottom when it comes to the classes. And what I'd like to know on this is, what class would they would would be would this be analogous to D and D wise, if any? And what could someone expect as far as what it brings to the table and what sort of role it um, leans towards? Sure. So. I'll start at the top, and you, you kind of dipped into this earlier, but the Arcanist. Yeah, so the Arcanist is sort of like a, uh, if you want to look in like D&D terms, like a, a blend of um, Artificer and Wizard, probably, maybe. Um, they're not quite as broad as Wizard, right? But they, they leverage um, this kind of elder technology and elder magic, right? Um, it's a little bit left up to the DM's interpretation on how much you want to make the player kind of go literally like uh you know uh ruin diving for new artifact or new relics to use right um you can kind of hand wave that if, if the player is not interested but if they are that's kind of a cool um kind of narrative way to introduce new spells as well right but they basically use this kind of arcane power that the elders had um so a little bit of damage lots of control right um it's a very control oriented class as well mm -hmm. um bard the cl the class that has the reputation for sucking in a lot of fantasy games. Yeah, right. So the bards, I think, was cool. So I was always, if you want a, um, a non D and D reference, the thing that really inspired me on bard was Kubo and the, and the three strings, right, or two strings, right. Um, the um, that that kind of um, powerful magic behind this kind of very um, almost like emotional tie to the music right mm -hmm. um and and so bards are very much more musical focused right like i said they've got this spellcasting system with the beginning mystical song right the player obviously can choose their instrument or their voice or you can make this kind of even poetic if you want to like speak right um but they have different stanzas they get more stanzas as, as you gain levels mm -hmm. um, for more powerful things but it's a very cyclic um thing right so so bards are really good in um very kind of utilitarian buffs. So they're also really good in longer fights because they don't really, as long as they can keep singing, right? They keep the song up. They don't get interrupted. Uh, they basically can keep going, right? They don't run out of spell slots, so to speak, right? So, um, uh, you know, buffs and, and also kind of uh, endurance, if you will. Yep. So next is Elementalist. Yeah, so the Elementalist... Um, uh, kind of your classic elemental magic users, right? They split into uh, uh, basically uh, you can specialize within uh, two of the elemental subgroups of you know earth, wind, um, sorry, earth, air, fire, uh, and water, right? So for any Avatar Last Airbender fans out there, right? Um, you can kind of think of them as as benders that can bend and. Uh, uh, adjacent ways, right? So, like, you could yeah. you could have like an earth and fire bender combo, but not an earth and air because they're opposite. Oh. I'd also I'd also be remiss if I if I didn't admit that I was drawing comparisons to the elementalist from Guild Wars, but that's just me. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, that's another good one too. Um, next is Magus. Yeah, so the Magus is um. I guess you could think of it as, like, as our take on the warlock, right? So they're bound to a um, uh, old, uh, old world creature of some kind, right? Whether that be uh, a dragon uh, or a fae or uh, a shade, sort of are the three options that we're, we've got currently. Um, they inherit their magic through this this binding, so their magic will feel a little bit similar to um, maybe the Elmas or the Arcanist, but uh, a little bit less uh, uh, usable, I guess, right? Since they're kind of inheriting this uh, this this magic, right? They don't quite have as many... They can't use their magic as often, right? Mm -hmm. um, the interesting thing on this one is that it's kind of uh, two, goo, two classes in one, right? So um, you can go kind of like a more uh, um, a spell sword um, style, right? And make yourself like a willpower-based... Um, where you're up in people's face, you've got this. Um, your binding is in the form of a weapon, right? So you're mm -hmm. you're you're hitting things with your you know um, magical axe uh, that you've got, right? And you're also occasionally casting spells. On um, the other side is you could make the bargain for knowledge, in which case you're an intelligence based, um, more of like a ranged actual uh, caster. Mm -hmm. So ne next on next on the list is plane shaper. 
Yeah, so plane shapers there are the reality benders, right? Mm -hmm. So they use planar magic, which literally changes the the fabric of the of the planes, right? So um, very physics uh, manipulation based magic, you know, kind of your classic, you know, gravity manipulation. But you know, we've also got, um, you know, I was, I was involved in a play test a few weeks ago where there's there's a spell that will literally turn a entity into a two dimensional entity for um, a period of time. Uh, not too long because they can't breathe, right? But uh, someone escaped from a jail by doing that, right? Mm -hmm. So it was pretty neat. So you know, you know, kind of manipulating reality. Yeah. Um, next would be the primalist. Yeah. So the primalist is kind of uh, again, if you want to think of it in in D and D terms, kind of a fusion of maybe uh, the barbarian and the druid, actually, right? So. Um, they are like a martial class, right? Mm -hmm. um, but they're the shapeshifters, right? They they all have a particular primal marking on them uh, in the form of some kind of animal, and they can transform into like a wearer version of that animal, right? So if you have a, if your if your primal marking is that of a bear, you transform into like a wear bear, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then that's kind of their deal. All right, um, ranger, i.e. the mo a the <laughs> most scub class in D and D five e. Yeah, so so Ranger is an interesting one because it's one of the ones that um, it's also on. Uh, there's going to be some changes in playtest too, but it's one of the ones that has actually been the hardest for me personally to kind of find. I like to have like a unique class mechanic uh, for every class to make them all feel a bit different, right? Um, so so Rangers are are going toward kind of this. Um, uh, like I said before, I, I kind of at first try to take them away. From the whole magic route, right? But I think they're drawing back toward it in in the kind of a, a wild magic, um, which is kind of like a, a more naturalistic magic, right? Um, so you know, I'd say that if you're if you're following the game, uh, ranger is the most likely thing that will change in playtest three as well as playtest two. Uh, still, the one that's that's getting the most love. Mm -hmm. um, now you can't you kind of mentioned it previously, but Next is ritualist. Yeah, so ritualists are the the faith based classes, right? Um, so so they're the ones who have a particular faith in a deity. So the two subclasses we have right now are um, acolyte, which is kind of like a, a more classic uh, priest or cleric, right? Um, that that focus on like a more traditional deity in one of the varying pantheons within this world. Mm -hmm. um, and the other one is the shaman, which focuses more on kind of like the natural spiritual side, right? Again, kind of like, you know, into the wild magic. But um, they're these resolve-based casters, right? Um, they have access to gossamer magic, right? Um, yeah, and that, that's their deal. All right. Um, rogues. Rogues. So similar to other systems, rogues like to sneak around and do sly things right mm -hmm. um so rogues actually have a core class mechanic that's not sneak attack <laughs> right um it was one of the, the example i gave earlier of um i was in a play test probably two years ago where somebody said oh i'm just gonna hide and shoot because that's what i do every turn and i immediately did a revamp on rogues right um so uh rogues have basically a, a turn by turn resource if you will right called their sly maneuver so they can use one sly maneuver every turn Right, um, and that basically is your identity as the rogue, right? So the assassins can do things like um, uh, quickly envenom their weapon for extra damage, right? They can sneak up behind somebody and try to backstab them if they don't notice them. Mm -hmm. um, ruffians are kind of like dirty fighting, right? Um, so they can get in and try to you know do cheap shots to throw people off balance, stun them, etc. Right? But your your use of your slam maneuver is you know kind of the the core concept of the rogue class. All right. And lastly, um, warrior, which is a, which is a class that, depending on edition and depending on the time frame, either get either gets barely either gets barely any attention or it gets attention and that causes massive arguments. <laughs> right. So so warriors are interesting in that, um, uh, you know, it, it was one of the things where I tried to make more variation in the subclasses than necessarily in the class chassis itself because i think some people at least in my experience they like the idea of a guy who just goes in and just hits things right mm -hmm. um or gal right um so something that goes in and hits things right and so i definitely tried to make something um in the vanquisher subclass that was good at hitting things and basically when you hit things you inspire the people around you to also hit things better right that's the kind of the gist of that but at the same time if you're looking for maybe a little more 
um, uh, you know, kind of like you're saying, where you know, uh, some people want their their uh, kind of fighter or warrior classes to have a little bit more options, right? You've got things like the Templar, right, which you know have a little bit of holy magic to them, mm -hmm. um, you know, and the tactician that can you know do different. Um, you know, kind of tactical moves, right? So I know there's that kind of, like, probably like you're alluding to, right? You know, don't turn my warrior into a wizard. I just want to hit things, right? Concept. So it kind of tries to straddle the line of being able to appeal to those different groups between the different subclasses. Now, me, me personally, if if somebody wanted to do war, war, turn warrior into a wizard, I'm perfectly fine with that. I mean, Gish has Gish has been a part of the lexicon for years. Um, yep. That was mostly me tongue in cheek, um, poking <laughs> fun at the controversy that happened when Tome of Battle came came out in the early two thousands, and right. and how that had the audacity to ha to allow fighters to do more than just be a one trick pony. Um, or right. Like, although the fighter back in third edition was nicknamed the Feeder because that's what he was mainly doing. Um, but one of the things I saw that was interesting when it came to equipment was the introduction of a parry die. And while parrying yep. has been a thing in D and D over the years, it's real it's it's really not um, been able to take center stage, like it ha like it has in say war in say Warhammer or some or several other um, fantasy games. Yeah. So. Um... Again, right, I wanted to, you know, make more options, right, mm -hmm. so, and, and more dynamic choices, right, so um, weapon choice, other than, you know, kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a hard line to straddle, because some people, they have a very specific idea of their particular character in their mind, right, I want this person to have two war hammers and just smash people, right, mm -hmm. and so you don't want to make it them... Uh, too mechanical of a choice, but at the same time, I wanted there to be some mechanical differences between weapons, right? So, um, one of the interesting ways to do that, obviously, there's there's damage, right, which is very one dimensional, right? So, um, well, what if we had something like a mall do a lot of damage, right? And you know, with forty four, do a lot of reliable damage, right? Because uh, the d fours are pretty reliable, but it has absolute garbage parry, right? Like you're not going to parry people very easily with the mall, right? So, um, you know, this kind of concept of having to trade better offense for worse defense, right? And it's just more decision points, right? So we definitely have, for all of the melee weapons, um, there are different parry die, right? And that's what you roll when you perform a parry on an attack, and you add that to your AC for that mm -hmm. particular attack. Now, something, something else, continuing on the theme of combat, that I find interesting is instead of going for a hierarchy of actions like, like some like some approaches have done, or the or the simple um, one and two, and may, and maybe a bon and maybe a bonus action that <laughs> something like Five E does. You went with an action point system in the form of momentum. Yep. Um, what was the impetus for doing for doing that particular setup, and what were you trying to emphasize and, avo and avoid? Yeah. So. Um... That was definitely another one of the systems where I felt like um, it really, it really needed to. I needed to change it um, a good bit in order to uh, facilitate a clean rule across combat. Right. So action point systems are like obviously nothing new. Um, right. Uh, and, and one of the the things that I really enjoyed about ours, right, is okay. You've got this certain number of uh, momentum. Right. Um, which we went with momentum because action points, um, for better or for worse, tend to, uh, for some players, correspond to amounts of time. So they're like, oh, I used two action points. Why can't I do something else for the last two seconds of my turn, right? Um, whereas momentum, I think, has a better flavor for, okay, as a warrior, you can't bend time, right, to make your attacks go faster. It's just that you are better at comboing your attacks together with your momentum and doing multiple things at the same time or doing things more cleanly together, right? That's that's mm -hmm. the concept. Um, so one of the things I think that this momentum system allowed us for is, you know, we have different actions you can perform, right, in combat, right? And the generic rule is, unless a specific action tells you otherwise, you can only do an action, or you can only do an action once on your turn, right? That's the general rule, right? So there's some commonly used actions where that that's broken, right? So like um, you can attack more than once and you can move more than once, right? Mm 
Um, but for most things, you can only do it once in a turn. And so what this tries to address is the problem of, like, you know, to, to use a classic um, example of, can you cast a spell with a bonus action and a regular action, right? The answer to that question is absurdly complicated, right? Mm -hmm. um, in my opinion, right? So uh, it's much clearer to say you use your cast a spell action this turn, you can't use it again, right? Unless you have some feature that says you can. Um, the other th part that I thought was nice on reintroducing movement into that, because I know in other similar systems, movement was separate, was uh, I know that myself personally playing some other systems, right? You get to the point where you, let's say you're, uh, you know, you have two attacks on your, your character that you can do in a turn, so you have a full action, right? That you can do two attacks. Mm -hmm. um, your full movement puts you five feet away from your target, or ten feet away from your target instead of five feet, right? So it's really frustrating because you have to like use your full action to move an extra five feet and can't do anything or you can't use any of your attacks right so it makes much more sense to say well maybe i can't attack twice but i can attack once right and so this this uh momentum system allows you to do that right mm -hmm. um so I, I really that that was very appealing to me um now given given all that given all that so now th now You've you've had the you've had the open play test in for a good for a good while, not for mm -hmm. not for an extremely lengthy amount of time, but in, but enough to enough to get a little bit of seasoning in there. Yep. Um, what would you say were some of the biggest takeaways that you had in terms of what people what people um com what people commented on the most consistently? Um, so uh, the most consistent thing is we will absolutely have better uh, bookmarks and uh, a table of contents in the next mm -hmm. uh, play, player guide, I promise. Um, that is 100% the number one response people have. Um, and uh, I think so the other ones um, I kind of hit on a little bit, right? We definitely got some feedback that the skill system felt a little disjointed from the rest of the rules, right? That it was almost like it was a different game, right? Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, you know, like, you know, some of, some of the stuff was just, you know, uh, you know, kind of like we were talking about here, right? You know, hey, this looks a lot, a lot like um, certain other systems, right? Like what's different, right? And so um, that has just been very encouraging to uh, go more bold on the, on, um, on the changes, right? So um, some of the stuff we were talking about previously, I think has been uh, a direct response to that. And I think when we get to the second play test, that'll definitely be... Um, uh, it'll stand on more on its own two legs. Yeah. Um, do you do you foresee it that as you go further and further with play tests that some of the not all of it but a significant amount of the five E DNA is going to slowly get phased out, or do you think a lot of that is going to be sticking? Um. Yeah. So I mean, I think some of it will get phased out a bit, right? I mean, like, it's always going to be sort of a middle ground between 5e and Pathfinder 2e, in, in a way, or Pathfinder in a way, right? Because that's, that was sort of the target space I was looking for, because I wished something like that, I wished I had something like that that would work in my world, right? Um, so, like, it'll always have, you know, it'll always be like a d20 system, right? Um, you know, it'll have combat and, and rounds, uh, things like that, right? Uh, you know, I, I think the advantage disadvantage mechanics are are brilliant, right? Um, so definitely keeping those, right? But you know, things like, um, you know, the the magic system will feel nothing like, um, or should feel very very little like like fifth edition, other than the fact that it has spells, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it should it should feel very different, right? Um, yeah, so so I think it'll it'll get more into its own, right? I think that this transition from the first to the second play test will probably be the biggest change. My hope is that the systems we have will um, just require tuning rather than kind of revamping um, in, in a third play test. Uh, that, that's where we're going for. All right. And when it, com when it comes to when it comes to some of the when it comes to some of the um, cla some of the class setups because we talked we talked about feats a little bit ago and one thing I'm curious about is how you is how you plan to address that particular issue. Yeah, so in this system, um, attribute score increases are pretty rare. Um, for uh, caster classes, you only get one at level ten, and for martial classes, you get two: one at level eight, one level fifteen. 
Um, and uh, so, and and they're completely independent from uh, what we call traits, which are ways to sort of take um, and and you know extra fun. They shouldn't be necessarily completely central to the way your class play or way your character plays, mm-hmm. um, but they should be things that give it more identity, right? Um, and, and we're putting those at um, uh, basically levels uh, every third level for for martial classes, so um, three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen, eighteen, mm-hmm. and then uh, for the caster classes, they get a subset of that, right? Uh, I believe at the moment the the draft is three, nine, twelve, eighteen, um, and some of that is because you know inherently you have a similar kind of choice in your character in what spells you are picking for your um, uh, for your caster class, right? So it's to give sort of more of that identity-based choices to the martial characters, so, so they get more. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so so I, I really like traits as a way to kind of um, first off, it's 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 like the good idea um, uh, catch-all, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, hey, this is a really kind of an interesting feature idea, but it's not it doesn't really fit into a class, right? Like you know, throw it into uh, you know, throw it in as a trait, right? So um, the other thing I wanted to do was to make skill-based uh, traits that would emphasize skills that weren't just observation, right? Um, right. Everybody looks at everything all the time or, or perception checks whatever all the time, right? Um, you know, some skills get a lot more love than others, right? So it was to, to help emphasize some of those not well-as-loved skills, right? So, for example, those traits, if you're a lore... Um, person where you can make a lore check on a monster that you're fighting, right, to try to recall kind of weaknesses about it, right, that gives you mechanical advantages in the fight against that monster, right? Mm-hmm. So it makes your lore check not just um, for certain info dumps at certain times, but you can actually, you know, use it there, right? Yeah. Um, you know, so we so we have stuff like that. So, so traits are something that I only foresee more of going in, um, but I think, you know, it'll still remain kind of that, you know, like four or so for uh, the caster classes, seven or so for um, martial classes. Because I, I don't want, um, maybe in a different system in the future, like other ideas, right? You can kind of have one of those, have way less classes, just have like a chassis-based thing, and then you're just mm-hmm. putting a bunch of traits on top of it or feats on top of it. Um, but I, I don't think this system is that. Yeah. And... When it com- when it comes to when it comes to uh, the traits through hero through heroic advancement, um, mm-hmm. a failing that I've seen some trait sy- some trait or feat systems do is put is put them all in one big grab bag. But given that you talked about skill based ones and, and the like, would it be fair of me to say that you plan on more strictly categorizing the different types of um, traits that are available? Yeah, so so they're um, they're tiered into I believe three tiers. Um, uh, there's basically like the standard traits. Uh, there's like heroic traits, and then like legendary traits, and that's based on your level, right? So there are certain traits you can only pick at higher levels. Um, so yeah, so so things like the skill, um, the things that let you use your skills more, would definitely be one of those kind of things you can pick at low levels, right? And then if we're talking about something that um, gives much more of an obvious uh, mechanical advantage to your character, those would be at those higher tiers, where they're competing against other things that also give your character um, like a more powerful boon. Yeah, and when it com- when it comes to the feats, I'm, I'm, I know it's I know it's traits. I just keep calling it that out of habit. It's, it's fine. Yeah, it's fine. Um, I'm guessing I'm guessing that because of the fact that it's on this tier based structure, there's not a whole lot of um, chaining in terms in terms of like feet, cha- like feet chains from Pathfinder or from Third Edition. Yeah, so so that's an excellent um, thing you're bringing up, right? Because one of the things that we don't have currently in the rule system that I would love to get to, um, probably one of the things that we're really targeting for Playtest Three, um, is the concept of multi-classing, right? So um, since this is sort of my first rodeo uh, in the design world, I definitely did not want to do uh, just pure take whatever levels and whatever class you want because that, that is a balance uh, nightmare, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, so one of the ideas that we have for um, a, a pseudo multi-classing system, if you will, um, would be to basically do exactly what you're saying with um, kind of trait chains where um, we basically have like a, a three-trait chain 
that would give you sort of some of the more like like probably a little bit lesser powerful versions right but of the more kind of iconic pieces of other classes yeah um in fact as i recall fourth edition did that where multi-classing was a uh, what were feats that you ha that you had to for lack of a better term buy, buy into um, yeah so instead, it's a similar instead thing of doing, instead of doing the whole okay you take okay you level up you can put a level in this in this class which um I was I was always critical of because it because it was a lot of it was a lot of work to get it to get a benefit that wasn't worth the effort being put in. Mm -hmm. um, and truth be told, when somebody when somebody multi classes, they're multi classing to get something very specific. Right. Um, like if some if somebody multi classes into rogue, they're doing it because they want to throw in sneak attack. If somebody's multi classing barbarian, they want it they want to throw in raging. If somebody wants if somebody um is multi classing into um into cleric, they prob they probably want cure they probably want some version of cure some version of cure wounds and some version of turn on dead and so on. And then and then there's people like me who multi who do multi classes of sorcerer paladins because because I'm a complete dick. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the point yeah the point is the point is is that because is that because of the fact that you'd ha that you may have to go through several levels where you're um where you are tr you're trying to get a specific thing before you go back to your main class. You ha you end up having this thing where you're de where you're dealing with a kind of false choice because once you get that level up, you know where it's going. It's just a matter of handling the formalities. Mm -hmm. And it's so it sounds like since you're doing this chain approach, um, that's not necessarily a ish a issue, especially since right. especially since you're only gonna ha even. Even with the setup that you have, you're only going to have a few um, a few slots. Now, when it comes to sp when it comes to um, spell casting, five um, E has has the approach of each class having their own specific um, spell spell book, and that's taken from a universal list. Whereas so whereas something like say fourth edition had a list had a list of powers for each for each class. What approach are you taking? Yeah, so we have um, we have something similar to kind of the fifth edition um, uh, a spell list for a class, right? Mm -hmm. uh, due to the way, um, due to the way the, I'm sorry, did I drop you on that? Sorry. Um, due to the way that the magic system is is like you know the is more specialized, it makes it a little easier. Right, so arcanists get access to all arcane spells. Period. The end. Done. Easy. Plane shapers get access to all planar spells. Right. Um, elementalists get access to their two elemental sub um, subcategories. Right. Uh, some of the other ones get a little bit more, like they get a little more mishmashy across the board. Right. But every spellcasting class basically has like a primary. Uh, you get pretty much all the ones, or you do get all the ones in this. In this. Uh, uh, spell school, if you will. Um, uh, some of them have like a little dabblings here and there that we specifically call out. But yeah. um, now, with all that, with all that, with all that said, I realize that this is a game that's in, that is in active development. What are you shooting for as far as a release window for the second playtest? Yeah. So um, we're. Uh, it was. I'm shooting for the July August time frame for second playtest. Right. Mm -hmm. Um. There's lots of big changes here. Um. Lots of spell system changes that require extensive rewrites of the the player guide. Mm -hmm. Um. So you know we're we're going to try to put that out. Uh. Yeah. Like the late summer time frame, along with another uh, adventure module. Um. For a bit higher level, I think. Um, and then probably also revamp the current one um, to make it support uh, the changes, right? So that you could run the current adventure modules out there as well. Um, so yeah, that, that's our plan for playtest two, mm -hmm. and then probably three to six months after that, probably closer to the six month end, um, do playtest three, which again I'm hoping is going to be um, more focused on 
tuning rather than kind of major revamps, right? Um, since this was the first uh, really public exposure that I've had to anything I've ever designed before, um, you know, we, you know, I, I kind of put playtest one out there, but you know, I uh, I didn't kind of shout it completely from the rooftops, right? Because you know, I just I wanted to get like some people look at it and kind of give me feedback because I figured that there would be pretty substantive changes, and um, we've been very pleased with the reaction we've gotten so far. Um, so definitely looking for hopefully to kind of widen the net a little bit for uh, the second play test. But all these things are be free, right? And then you know, as far as quote release, right? Um, I anticipate that the the player guide and these playtest modules will sort of even when the player guide is finalized, like always be uh, free, pay what you want, right? Um, we'll have like a print on demand option for people who want it. Obviously, mm -hmm. have to pay for that because it costs money, right? But um. Uh, but like a PDF version, probably always free. Um, because really, I, I came into this, it was it was just a passion project, right? I really like doing this. I really like running this system. And I just wanted to say, hey, you know, um, I'm just throwing this out there. Does anybody else think this is cool too, right? And if people say yes, then we'll keep going. Um, and, and so far, we've gotten some pretty good good feedback. Yeah. And I'll certainly be looking forward to the development. And I, I already have to give you props for the fact that the character sheet that you threw in not only did not only did you throw you threw in a character sheet that's form fillable, which makes my job easier. Um, <laughs> you you also threw up pregens that have their own little um, guide, and that's some that's something that even the even the big shots don't do. The the yeah. little bit of advice with e with each pregen, a lot of a lot of times with quick starts or with or with play tests that have pregens, they'll just put they'll just put out the sheet, hand it to you, and th and then say swim, damn it. <laughs> yeah we wanted to make it as easy to get into as possible like i said i know that there's a lot of options out there right um uh, unfortunately um probably a point that, that you would agree with me on right i think that um like like the big the big guys get a lot of attention and, and i i kind of hope that as the the scene grows and the amount of people playing grow that um kind of the smaller and, and indie or publishers get get more attention because there's so much good stuff out there mm -hmm. um but you know, uh, yeah, I know that there's there's a million things that people could try. So so why try this, right? So I try to make it as easy as possible because I appreciate I appreciate people joining joining us on this this crazy journey. Mm -hmm. And well, for better or worse, you got me stuck on you got me stuck on the journey. So my sympathies. <laughs> That's great. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. <laughs> and anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on. Um, uh, hopefully, you know, maybe in a few months or so, um, when the the second one's coming out, um, you know, I have some uh, other interesting things to talk about. I'd definitely be happy to come back on. Yep. And of and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show. Show and enjoy and enjoy what's at play here, and there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>